I believe that she can continue to do the kind of work that she has been doing, that she was doing before her license was suspended, uh, in her job as Attorney General. I really think we should be talking about due process of law, the presumption of innocence, and there's a broader scandal here with Ms. Kane involving the pornographic emails, the, the Supreme Court and everything like that. What the Senate is really supposed to be looking at is whether she is able to do the job of Attorney General with a suspended license. Uh, she is a member of the bar under suspension. Uh, the Supreme Court, in their ruling <coughs> suspending her license, says this does not remove her from office. So the Senate now has this process that they're looking at in order to remove her from office. But you cannot remove somebody from office uh, because you don't like uh, the direction of what they're, they're doing. And, and I think that's a large part of the political problem here that underlays this whole discussion. Dennis, would you like to add to this um, regarding impeachment versus direct address? The disability that exists is the fact that she doesn't have a law license. And it simply is, it flies in the face of all common sense to say that an attorney general without a law license is not disabled from fully serving and properly serving. We need an attorney general that, that has a law license. Phil? Well, I hope we can get into the history of the provision. No, it's not appropriate. 22 other states don't have the requirement that you be a member of the bar. You don't have to be a licensed member of the bar to be the U.S. Attorney General or a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. The term of art in most constitutional papers is learned of law. Article 4, Section 5 of the state constitution, I thought I'd just read it. No person shall be eligible to the office of Attorney General except a member of the bar of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Well, you know what? She is a member of the bar, so it, it's, it's false. But I think there's a deeper problem here, because an impeachment trial would bring in all this other stuff. She'd be able to defend herself. The people of Pennsylvania would have a much better idea of what this what this thing is about, which is not just about Kane's law license. They're upset about a whole host of other issues. And I think that's what Ed says. You're upset about her conduct, not her law license. So it's disingenuous. It's dishonest. And they don't even know the history of the provision, which is really crazy. It's not about an inc incapacitation like this. It's about a physical or mental incapacitation and things that don't rise to the level of misconduct. We adapt ourselves and our thinking to the time in which we live, and that's one of the reasons the constitutional provisions are written broadly. Disabilities and their meaning shift. They change with the time. And I'm saying that if losing your law license and for, for a position that requires you to be a lawyer is not a disability, then disabilities don't exist outside, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a, a pickaxe to somebody's head. Uh, this this is this is this is a, a time in which we have to start thinking, uh, you know, in 20th and 21st century contexts as to what constitutes a disability. Lastly, I, I do want to point this out. Uh, you had uh, you 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 had. Uh, uh, well, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, maybe I'm disabled. Go ahead. I'll, I'll get back to it. Let's move on. Walter, go ahead, please. Well, one, uh, I, I think, point that's important to understand here is part of the reason I think that the Senate is doing this direct address process is because it is less cumbersome. It can be quicker than impeachment. And uh, I was in the uh, process as, at the time, first Deputy Attorney General when Rolf Larson, former Justice of the Supreme Court, was... Uh, I, I was part of the process that investigated, uh, indicted, convicted, and sentenced him. Uh, and then there was an impeachment. Uh, but the House had the sense and the understanding that you, you cannot start an impeachment process while there are criminal charges pending uh, because they're charges. You need a cause. You need a conclusion. And, and so the impeachment could not start until after she has been not just convicted, but had a judgment of sentence entered. And that's a process that will probably take place uh, in, in terms of the trial. We don't know the outcome, but that process will probably not conclude until sometime in 2017 when a new term will start for the Attorney General, whether it is Kathleen Kane or somebody else. So uh, I think that's why the Senate is trying to use this process, but I agree with uh, Bill on, on the analysis of the purpose of it. And 
I, I disagree with Dennis on the conclusion that she is not a member of the bar. Technically, she is a member of the bar, but her license is suspended. Uh, just like a student is in school, they're, they're a member of the student body. If they get suspended from school for some purpose, they are still a member of that student body at that school. And I think that uh, that's what the Supreme Court said when it said, this does not remove her from office. What doesn't come up at all is what was the wisdom of removing someone, of punishing someone before we had the due process of law here? Why isn't the Senate looking at all the trouble? You know, the Senate can also be doing this with judges. They can be impeaching. The House can be looking at all these people. Why aren't they looking at the turmoil in the state Supreme Court that, that led to this bad decision? And, and I think people should be asking that. Why aren't they looking at the broader problem here instead of just picking on Kathleen Kane? Section 3 dealing with impeachment says one of the things they can do when you're impeached is the disqualification to hold any office of honor, trust, or profit under this commonwealth. Kathleen Kane can seek re-election and come back if, if, if she's victimized by this direct address. So these guys, there's a certain amount of chaos theory at play here, and they could be putting her in the governor's office by doing this. What happens as she continues? I mean, everybody talks about let's step back, take a pause, and examine this. Does anyone recognize the level of turmoil, the level, a level of, 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 of dysfunction, uh, the fact that Right now, we have an attorney general who has uh, appointed a special prosecutor, handed over a million emails, and 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 clearly is is reaching uh, the point where you know if if she, if she becomes f uh, more upset at uh, the fact that uh, her enemies real and imagined might remove her from office, they basically try to blow up the world like some Bond villain. I mean. Uh, this, this, uh, the dysfunction, the danger, this is what government is elected to intervene and, and call to a halt. Now, wait a minute. This is, this is ridiculous. You know, I think everybody recognized this pornographic email thing had to be examined in some independent fashion. She did it. These guys don't, don't want an investigation. And coming on the heels of the whole Sandusky case where they're denying that they dragged their feet, and now they're dragging their feet over the, the pornographic email thing. Again, the U.S. Attorney General does not have to be a member of the bar, and you don't hear FBI agents marching down Pennsylvania Avenue saying this is a, a really terrible thing. And, and Dennis, I have to say, it's sort of, you should not be using the term disability. And, and, and let me say this. This direct address thing that was put in the Constitution in 1874 is rooted in lunacy law. And when you go back and you read the case against the judge, they're talking about imbeciles and, and lunatics and idiots. This comes out of 19th century eugenic law. And it's appalling. There was actually in the early 1900s an Idiocy Prevention Act. They were going to sterilize every idiot in Pennsylvania, which would have been bad news for people in Pittsburgh, let's say. You know? Dennis, this is not a disability. This is a law license. And people every day get up without a law license and function quite well. Scarnati in the Senate was I'm saying, about to walk we, out. we have a. Bill, let me interrupt and give Dennis a chance to respond, please. Go ahead, Dennis. First of all, many things are rooted in old uh, theories that then become adapted. Uh, to the later dates. As we came to understand things, we adapted them to our times. For instance, in 1968, they again placed that clause in the state constitution. Now, you can be disabled mentally, you can be disabled physically, you can be disabled legally. Y in other words, a disability basically implies an inability to do something. Like practice law, Bill like practice law. Uh, this is simply the fact that we no longer live in the 19th century, but we do understand that when you can't do something, you shouldn't be in charge of it. You don't lose your, your whether you're learned in law, and I think, that's the, I think that's the appropriate catchphrase here. Walter, what specific portions of the Attorney General's job is she currently prevented from doing because of her license suspension? Uh, I think she cannot, uh, it's basically she can't go to court. She can't sign legal documents that are filed with court. Uh, she, and, and there's a, an issue related to 
warrants that that need to be signed, or, or just plain briefs and uh, indictments, etc. But that doesn't mean that the office can't do that. That's what is done all the time by, and can be done by the first deputy, by the executive deputies, the chief deputies, all the deputies, attorneys general in, uh, I think, 20 offices around the state. Now, if something is happening up in Erie, in their office there, uh, she doesn't have to be there. She's not there. And uh, she handles issues related to, uh, she can uh, ha handle all kinds of operational issues, administrative issues, hiring and firing, hiring outside special counsel. I mean, in a sense, the argument is she can't hire this lawyer uh, because she doesn't have a license. She can't hire Doug Gansler, former Attorney General of Maryland. Uh, yet she's hiring him, you, you could argue, because he is a lawyer and she wants somebody who's a lawyer to do some investigative work. You were invited to testify at yesterday's hearing and declined. Why did you decide not to participate? Uh, I met with the chairman of the committee an hour before the hearing, and he uh, indicated to me that they did not want to hear uh, what I was planning to testify about. I was planning to say that I've had contact with uh, eight different deputies, attorneys, general, uh, many of whom were there before, uh, most of whom were there before Kathleen Kane got there, will be there after she leaves, whenever that is. Uh, and they are functioning well. They are doing their jobs and they are making decisions. And I'm meeting with them representing clients and I don't always like all the decisions they make. Uh, but that's their job to represent the Commonwealth. My job is to represent my clients and we do that and we do that in a very civil capacity and the office functions. The office may not be the most pleasant, comfortable place to work. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not comfortable in Afghanistan either. I mean, it's, it's a problem that is unfortunate for the people that are there, but that doesn't mean that the office doesn't operate and that she can't do uh, most of what she does and can't do maybe some of the things she might have done in the past. But again, she can make decisions that are policy in nature, and that's what Ed Rendell was saying. Uh, she just can't make uh, legal representations to the courts. You were acting Attorney General in, I believe, 95 when Ernie Pree resigned. From your experiences, what do you think the environment in the Attorney General's office is like right now? Uh, I think that it is probably not. I mean, I would guess, in fact, that if you're a Deputy Attorney General and you meet people and they say, what do you do? And that's a common thing. And whether, you, you know, wherever you meet them or even your friends uh, and you say, I work in the Attorney General's office, they say, oh, my God, how can you work there? I mean, it, it's not a pleasant environment. I did deal with that. I was a first deputy. I was a law school friend of Ernie Priates. I was a close friend of his. And uh, I didn't ever intend to be first deputy. I had headed his transition operation, and I failed in the job of finding a first deputy. And I decided to do it uh, for a period of time, and it ended up being uh, six and a half years. And at the end, uh, one of the things I had to deal with on a constant basis was the uh, disruption in the office. Now. It was very different because Ernie Priate, as soon as he pleaded guilty and he was not indicted, he had, there was a, a criminal information the day that he pleaded guilty and he resigned all at once, gone. But Kathleen Kane has not been found guilty. She has been charged. And, and I want to say something about that, too, that nobody talks about, okay? Kathleen Kane's underlying offense is leaking a document involving a grand jury from 2009. Okay? That's wrong. Happens all the time uh, in prosecutors' offices, and the reason I bring it up is when the Montgomery County uh, grand jury issued a presentment recommending criminal charges against Kathleen Kane and sent it to the district attorney of Montgomery County, that document in 2014, I guess it was, maybe it was 15. That document was leaked to the Philadelphia Inquirer. That is the same level of crime. I would argue it's a more serious crime because it's current. And no one has ever said, hey, we ought to investigate that. Hey, how'd that happen? Who did that? Nobody has done that. And the district attorney of Montgomery County brought the criminal charges, uh, and that's, that's where this is proceeding. I don't mean to belittle uh, the commission of a criminal offense. But I'm just saying, let's be consistent in how we prosecute the same level of crime. I, I, think, I think we also need to be clear 
though, that what Kathleen Kane is charged with is two counts of perjury. Okay, that, that, that is a crime that really goes to character. And, and, and a law license, by the way, is supposed to attest to one's character. I just don't think we can sort through and say we got to protect these people, but we can't protect these people. You know, so there is an underlying fairness thing. I should say as a writer, I'm appalled with everything that's going down there with this leak, because here you have a reporter from the Daily News calling one of the prosecutors and basically turning Kane in. We're supposed to be protecting our sources, not burning them is, is, is what happened there. So I, I, hear, Wait a second, I, I hear what you're oh, saying, You're saying Dennis, that Chris Brennan handed over a source? He, he called the prosecutor involved. In, I, you know, I haven't been getting into the personalities. He called one of the prosecutors and read verbatim what had been given to him, and it led to these charges. Yes, I think that, that I've been in a similar position, and I would never do something like that. I think that's very so careless, you, very unprofessional. And now, and now you have a source that's going to jail. And, and Bill, that's, that's Bill. something every writer in Pennsylvania should be concerned about. Bill. Bill, should he not have called them, just let them be surprised in the newspaper? I mean, aren't you supposed to verify these things? Dennis, supposed he to had a road a You know, when I wrote that book about patronage at the turnpike, we can get into patronage at the Attorney General's office. Well, I got a whole stack of things, right and I didn't call up the lawyers of the turnpike and read them verbatim. He had the road map there to, to proceed with his story. I don't think he handled this at all well, and it's appalling. It truly is. Now, you want to go to the, the patronage issue. I, I think one of the things Kane is looking at Let's, here in the office, and I understand that Mr. Beamer has had a long career, but she really can't depend on these people because they're, they're holdovers from the last office. If she'd fired everybody when she came in, I think she, she'd be in much better shape. Well, let's give Go Dennis ahead. a chance to respond, please. Yeah, look, I can tell you, as a reporter, Bill, you're supposed to call all people involved in the story. You need to be open and upfront about what it is you're doing. Uh, that's obviously that's going yeah, to tell them a that you acquired a particular document. I'm sorry. You're about to publish that fact in the newspaper. That's not giving up your source. And and I think you know uh, the differences I've had with Chris Brennan over the years could could fill uh, one of your books. But the fact is, you're being unfair to Chris in in saying this. This is this is a terrible thing to say about a reporter. He didn't give up his source. Well, I, I I'm 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 sorry. It it, it it's a, it's appalling what it is they've done down there. Well, Dennis, you, for, for viewers that may not recall, you had a decades-long career as a reporter, particularly in the Pittsburgh area. In your estimation, how would you characterize her relationship with the media, and do you think that the media has covered her fairly? The media created Kathleen Kane. She was the darling. Everybody bought into this theory about Sandusky uh, case uh, being delayed, even though Corbett was the only person who actually took it on. Uh, and and so and so uh, she was she uh, the expectations were so high she was made such a star that it was bound to start to unravel. But the fact is, uh, the the story that was published on March sixteenth of two thousand fourteen, I guess it was, uh, in the Philadelphia Inquirer about the abandoned sting a story, you know, she could have let that alone. She could have said, "This was my decision. This is why I thought this." and then let it alone. But no, she said, this is war. And so she began to go after people that she imagined must have been the source of the information. That's the, that's, that's the origin of her problem. Her problems with the press stem from the fact that sometimes you're going to win in coverage, sometimes you're going to lose, but if you declare war, uh, win or lose, you're gonna take casualties, and now she's one of them. No. Long ago in the 80s when I was working on the book about Roy Zimmerman, I, I had a nice interview with Jim West, who was the acting U.S. attorney. And I was talking to him, this was the Bud Dwyer prosecution, why wasn't this person prosecuted? Why? And, and a, 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 turn, a U.S. attorney, West, says to me, uh, trying to figure out why the case isn't prosecuted is like nailing jello to the wall. All right, and that's always been good advice to me. And I thought this was harebrained from the start. And, and, and Dennis, I don't know, when, when people come to me as a writer, it's not about retaliation or grinding an ax, it's to tell their side of the story. You know, and, 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 and so you're putting what happened with Kane here in this newspaper, this really distressed, troubled newspaper, what happened, and, and, and trying to 
present it in, in legalese terms that she was retaliating. She was trying to tell her side of the story, you know. And again, I've gotten packets of information. If I were to get a packet of information from a grand jury, I would have the sense not to call the grand jury judge or lawyer about it. That's a road map that you, that you then use to go out. It was mishandled by the Daily News. Now their source is in criminal straits. I, don't, I think she was trying to tell her story. I would have nothing to do with either the Inquirer or the Daily News. I think they're bad She news. wasn't trying to tell her story. She was trying to tell a bad story about Frank Fina. She could have her, let the whole the story, thing about this well, thing I, go, but she imagined it was Frank Fina to blame, so she wanted to get even. I think uh, De that's Dennis, not telling her story. Dennis, I think you've given a very good analysis of how this whole thing started, and it, it certainly could have been avoided. As Attorney General, it made no sense for her to get in a fight with somebody who was a former Deputy Attorney General. I mean, Attorney General, if you want to fight with somebody, fight with the governor, fight with the president, uh, fight with the president of the Senate, wh wh whatever, but don't fight with a former Deputy Attorney General. Uh, why she did that, uh, I, I don't know. And, and that is what started the, the whole problem for her. She could have and she should have just referred all those cases to the Ethics Commission. It was very small amounts of money overall, and it involved a, a uh, source. The, the person who was the witness against those legislators had been charged with a $450,000 fraud against the Department of Education, and those charges were dropped in return for his helping with this, and that would have been a difficult case to prove those cases have not gone to court, the legislators did plead. I'm not saying they didn't do it, but I think uh, it was just unfortunate that she got so wrapped up in that issue. Dennis, uh, you invoked the name of Frank Fina for the benefit of our, our viewers at home that are following along. Can you remind us who he is and what her relationship was with him? Well, Frank Fina was the uh, uh, probably the most celebrated prosecutor in that office at the time. He oversaw in particular the bonus gate investigations. He also oversaw uh, much of the Jerry Sandusky investigation. Uh, he, uh, he basically was, was known as a straight shooting kind of uh, hard as nails, uh, no nonsense kind of prosecutor. Uh, and um, he clearly did not appreciate uh, uh, Kathleen Kane suggesting that somehow he had slow walked the Jerry Sandusky investigation, uh, and there's never been really a credible account that makes it appear so. Uh, but uh, uh, he resigned, but before, res before leaving uh, the office, he informed her about this investigation in Philadelphia and said he had referred it to the FBI because one of the people involved in her campaign had come up in the course of this investigation and he thought that would be a conflict. Uh, he left, and from there, the investigation, uh, uh, the Sting investigation, uh, was dead in the water. It never proceeded. What are the political odds of her, her re-election campaign? I think they're doing a good job to promote Kathleen Kane, and I, you know, they could, they could put her in the U.S. Senate if they keep pushing it. I, I think people smell a rat. What Dennis is talking about with Fina and everybody else should have been in an impeachment hearing. We should get the whole truth out. This thing stinks to high heaven, and and I think they're promoting Kathleen Kane. I think they're falling into a trap, and God bless them. Dennis, I hope they never try to promote me. Then uh, look. What, what, we're, what we're going to then, uh, the conclusion we would seem to have reached here is that she can serve in an office that she cannot, under law, be elected to in the current circumstances. I, I, don't, I don't think this augurs well for Pennsylvania. What would the aftermath be if the, the sentiment and sent, Senate and ultimately the governor were to remove her from office? I would expect that she would uh, bring that to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and they ultimately will decide the law is what the court says it is. Dennis, what will you be watching as this process continues to, to move on? Mark my word. Kane's going to organize or arrange some other kind of release of materials and information. It has been, it has been nothing but uh, a circus of distractions thrown up different places uh, to, to get away from the one question, and that is whether an attorney general charged with two counts of perjury and uh, temporarily barred from the practice of law 
can hold this office. That's what it's going to come down to, but uh, heaven knows the kinds of distractions uh, that are going to be thrown out there. Well, and also I'd point out this isn't being done in a political vacuum. You have a primary election coming up. You have Wolf is a Democrat. I think Kane does have a lot of support, particularly among women. So there, there, there could be blowback on this. I, I really think there should have been a broader investigation in the House dealing with the FINA stuff, the email stuff. And I think that's part of what the blowback of this is going to be, that Kane's been railroaded without due process. And that's really where I'm coming from. It's not a personal affection for Kathleen Kane, it's an affection for due process of law and fairness here. And I think this could blow up big time on people if they're not careful.